I said, hi, my name is Ramesh Longani. I'm, I'm a professor at uh, Doan University. I'm one of the organizers of, of the meeting here. And um, so now that we got all sort of the technical stuff out of the way, uh, I, like I said, I'm excited to start day two of, you know, hashtag no coast SciComm. So if you want to use that, if you want to live tweet stuff, you can use the hashtag no coast SciComm. Um, and so I'm excited to start today with today's keynote speaker, Andy Revkin. Um, Andy is the founding director of the Initiative on Communication and Sustainability at Columbia, Columbia University's Earth Institute. There, he's building programs, courses, collaborations, where he's bridging gaps between science and society, society to cut climate risk and spread resilience. Um, Andy has written on climate change for more than 30 years, reporting from all over the world, from the North Pole to the White House, uh, to the Amazon, to the Vatican, and he's done that mostly for the New York Times. Um, from 2010 to 2016, he built and taught courses in online communication and environmental filmmaking making at Pace University. And he's written a number of books, most notably The Burning Season, season The Murder of Chico Mendes, and The Fight for the Amazon Rainforest, which was actually made into an award-winning award film by HBO and has won most of the top awards in science journalism, along with the Guggenheim Fellowship and investigative reporters and editors awards. So you can already hear, uh, you can already tell why we wanted Andy to come give a, give a keynote today. Um, but Andy's more than, than a science communicator. In his spare moments, he's a performing songwriter. Um, and I uh, hopefully I'll mention some of that in his keynote. Um, on a personal note, um, Andy was, for me, Andy was one of the first science journalists that I read as a student and was my first introduction to great science communication. Um, his work, continues to impact my own students at Doan as I use many of his pieces in my own classes. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with him on the climate change podcast, Warm Regards. And you can follow Andy on Twitter and his handle is at Revkin, R-E-V-K-I-N, um, keynote. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Andy. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure and an honor. Um, I'm going to dive right in because uh, the time is short and we have Lots to explore. Um, right, I'm going to take you on a little time travel. We're clicking back to March 15th, basically, uh, as the lockdown was getting into place. Um, I got on this thing called StreamYard.com, which is a way to broadcast live to several different platforms at once. And one of the first two people I connected with was Ramesh, along with Jeremy Zalar, uh, just almost randomly. I just said, hey, anybody out there want to talk? So, and we were talking in March 15th was about this meeting. And so um, it's a great conference. So we postponed it to mid August. So if you're interested, come back out. Um, uh, but it's, uh, but yeah, so that's what we were going to do. We were going to really wrestle with best practices in terms of science communication. That's great. Uh, and I think it, that demonstrates again that everyone's kind of scrambling yeah. to reinvent uh, how we meet, how we convene. And I know any of you out there have a sense that face-to-face -face, it really always creates um, informal exchanges. The hallway thing, the, the water cooler thing is a real mm -hmm. thing. It's hard. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping in a way that what we can do here, if this, with this particular portal can be a little bit like that. It's never going to be the same unless, well, I could have a, a drink here and you could have a right. drink there. And people coming on board can, uh, if, if I'd like to settle this into a group, so I do, it, if not daily, at least uh, several times a week. So that was my little launch uh, in the middle of chaos of trying to get some traction on new ways to connect across space, even as we're socially distanced. And it was, it's really fun to think of Ramesh and this meeting being uh, right at that beginning. We then pop the meeting forward to where we are now, and you're going to learn about how we can go forward from here, um, both online and eventually back in the, the world of true face-to-face -face interaction. How do you make information matter? How do you not just tell a story, but create pathways to sharing stories for communities to connect with uh, uh, expertise in search of solutions to tough problems? And as uh, Ramesh said, you know, I met him through this other experiment that started back in 2015 or 16. I can't even remember uh, when uh, some other... Uh, when Jacqueline Gill and, and um, others got together, uh, Eric Holthouse and me and uh, Stephen Lacey to start a conversation around climate change, uh, reflecting that this is a, climate change is a complicated issue. It's not just physics, it's not just 
biology, it's not just sociology, it's not just economics, it's everything. And so conversation felt like a good way to navigate that and to bring people through. Um, the core question for me every day is this one, can we make reality cool? You know, I know I can tell a good story. I've been doing it for decades and stories are great, but they don't always change the world. And I learned that too late as a journalist that just putting out information is insufficient. And the word cool is an important word. This is a hashtag I use sometimes because reality has to have a pull. It has to, you have to be motivated to seek it. Even those of us who feel like we're deeply engaged with the world and finding problems and solutions, uh, solutions to problems, we can get stuck if we're not thinking creatively about the engagement part of finding a path forward. And so the answer is yes, we can do that. We can make reality cool, but the, it's really a very big if. It should be even bigger font than that. It should fill the screen. And you know, you think here I am 35 years into a career as a journalist, um, won a lot of awards, as you heard, have had the privilege of a Guggenheim and written five books and literally been around the world uh, and doing that conventional journalism thing. And it was great, uh, but I, it took me way too long to realize that journalism is a shrinking wedge of a growing pie of ways to share and shape information and connections. And that's what led me in 2010 to do a hybrid. I was teaching at Pace University and still doing my blog, Dot Earth for the New York Times. But essentially I started out in this world of print when things just seemed simple. Uh, you can see there the, back in the magazine newsroom and I, my first cover story on global warming was in 1988. But just to give you one quick hint of how complicated this issue really is, or just the idea of storytelling as a pathway to success on an issue, the back cover of that magazine had a cigarette ad. So I was basically selling global warming concern on the front, and we were selling tobacco on the back. 1988 in a science magazine. Looking back at that now feels really weird. At the time, I think those of us in the newsroom thought it was weird, but it wasn't like, hey, we need to boycott this magazine or, or leave. Uh, so it's kind of a tough issue. Uh, I came to the New York Times in 1995 and learned about that particularly tough ecosystem for dealing with uh, complicated issues like global warming. It's not easy to fit it on the front page without uh, sort of oversimplifying. And that led me to blogging, um, which was a new way to engage audiences in an interrogatory approach to communication. A lot of what I did on that blog for, for nine years, 2,800 posts, 100,000 comments, most of which I vetted, uh, was questions. Can the human race shift from sprint to a marathon? That's a very important question. I think that's what we're seeing right now. We were in a sprint and uh, this virus knocked us back in a big way. And a big question to be asking right now is what do we build Rebuilding the old norms isn't going to work, uh, but how do you build forward? How do you create uh, a more measured, responsive, resilient approach to societies and economies? A really important question for anyone in the sciences. Uh, and that's an open one. So I came to Columbia a year ago, exactly, pretty much, with this grand idea of, hey, you know, creating a, a center at this place that mostly studies the physical, biogeophysical earth and the biological earth. Well, what about the communication earth? Uh, what are we doing to figure out ways to make information matter in this nascent part of the earth system? The communication environment we're in is literally like a new earth system to my mind. And it's brand new. It's like so microscopically new that uh, I think anyone who thinks they understand it is um, in sort of a state of denial. Uh, and when I was there, you know, we started out grand with doing the conventional things that we all are doing on all our campuses and institutions, you know, open houses and some people here, Kate Marvel has done TED Talks and we're doing training for corporate leaders in climate science and, and some, some of our faculty and students got out and to the streets, um, obviously, as, as many have. And that was before the lockdown. And then along comes this thing, right? January, Laurie Garrett, Laurie Garrett, who's been on my webcast a number of times, was tweeting seriously worried uh, about what was emerging. By April, this virus that emerged in China had was killing people in the Amazon rainforest. So, wow, an extraordinary new challenge. And we're, this is the information environment. They call it an infodemic around the pandemic. And a big chunk of what I've been examining is 
how do we get through that? How do you cut through that infodemic around the pandemic? And it can leave you th feeling like this um, photographer, a, a TV reporter in 2009, I took this picture at the climate talks in, um, in uh, Copenhagen. And you know, we all need a group hug. So know that you're feeling that feeling of real concern, desperation, personal stress, community stress. How do you get your work done? How do you pursue tenure? How do you be effective in this environment? And that's a really, um, so it's good to pause and do that. But at the same time, I was looking around these last few months and, and you could see even with what happened, even with this jolt we've had to the earth system, this part of the earth system into our biology, it was January, look at the, back in January 22nd, I think it was, Lauren Graber, uh, Gardner, sorry, at Johns Hopkins University, and Ensheng Dong at the engineering school there, the Applied Engineering School, they launched the coronavirus uh, dashboard in a heartbeat, literally overnight. They did it in an iterative way. It wasn't perfect at the very beginning, but it was a way to start to aggregate data on what we know about the virus, what we know about uh, infection rates, what we know about deaths, and to do it with some rigor so that there's someone in the world had some way of reliably gauging these flows of information. And within weeks, that site had garnered billions with a B of views. And it only exists because two people had the motivation to make reality cool. To, to say, hey, we have access to some of this data. We're at Johns Hopkins, one of the great public health schools, and we have a, a way to build a platform. Let's just do it. And that, that just do it part, having an iterative capacity to dive in and get things d done to test and, and iterate as you're going forward is a key to success in communication. And it's not storytelling. It's enabling. It's creating portals for data. It's creating connectivity uh, in ways that didn't exist before. Um, and there are other initiatives that had already been underway. I, one of my favorites years ago, from years ago was uh, Sarah McNulty and others launched Skype a Scientist uh, as a hashtag initially on Twitter. And now it's a real thing. It's a, it's a 501c3. I think they finally got their status. And it's a way for, for, for teachers and students and librarians and community groups to connect with scientists um, on basic questions or just to get to know how science works. And they're, they're on steroids right now, obviously. You have my friend Seamus Khan, who was the chairman of the sociology department at Columbia until this year, until uh, till like a month ago. And you know, when you're a department chair, you're tenured, you don't have to necessarily keep doing innovative things, right? But in March, he dove in with others and within days, they created a, 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 a teaching calendar and port, portal so that anyone stuck at home who had skills they could share or insights uh, could start doing it in a way that was some coherence and some quality control. And he taught a course from the get-go, from his home, and how to be an ethnographer. So this is for the middle school and, and high school students. You're in the middle of a historic disruption to the human journey. What can you do around you right now to record what you're seeing in a way that will matter to historians going forward? What a fantastic course to be able to just launch in a few days. And then here is another amazing one. Uh, Earthrise.education was being built a year ago or more by uh, Dan Hammer, who I got to know when I was at National Geographic Society. And he's a technologist who was already doing something called Earthrise.media, where a reporter on deadline looking at China building islands in the South China Sea or something could have access to satellite images to uh, enrich the story. And now he's got created Earthrise.education, which takes this a step further. What you can see on the left is a really important story that Reuters did in uh, June uh, on evidence that Yanomami Reserve, uh, Indian territories in the Amazon rainforest were being invaded by gold miners. And the story indicates uh, Reuters worked with Earthrise Media, a nonprofit group that analyzes satellite images, to plot the expansion of the mines by looking at satellite images over time. What that story doesn't say directly is that it was high school students in, in Walton, Massachusetts and in Iowa, southeastern Iowa, before the lockdown, were engaged in sifting satellite images. What an engaging way to pull a student into a screen to say your work can help 
identify areas where miners are illegally invading Indian territory in the world's most important forest. And they did that before and then during lockdown. These students have been doing this. They're planning for the fall now with some new projects. And that, so I'm all about what are the models, what, I, what can I do to help expand and iterate that model so that teachers facing screen bound students going forward in the fall can know there's, again, make reality cool. How do you make a screen cool when we're all sick of this, right? One way is to say, you can actually get something done in the real world as a student in Iowa or in Massachusetts. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, so, you know, again, March 15th, my, my experiment facing lockdown was to start this thing called Sustain What? The name basically comes from my um, antipathy for the word sustainability. So the word sustainability is in my job title, right? I'm the uh, founding, founding director of the Initiative on Communication and Sustainability. But my first question always is, sustain what? Having that, you know, what are the words, what does that word mean? And sustain what gets you to how much forest, how many species, how hot? And then you go to sustain how and why, and the why is the ethics. And so that, that started then with two sessions that day, one of them with Ramesh. <laughs> And uh, it has built into a pretty cool little portal. I've had more than 200,000 200, visitors uh, since we started, about 80 episodes. Have, and as I said back then, uh, my thought was it would evolve into kind of a regular routine. And now it's Mondays are, are sort of skill building. The first one I did was with a, a um, emergency room doctor at Columbia, who you may have heard um, posted this incredibly haunting um, string on Twitter back at the peak of the surge of cases in New York City when these doctors and nurses and orderlies and families, of course, remotely were facing this trauma of incredible just death upon death upon death. And what was so interesting to me was that um, he connected with Isabeau um, uh, Doucette uh, at AJ Plus, and she turned his already gripping narrative, which became a Washington Post op-ed as well, into a, a haunting animation. So you can find that. Um, just Google for, well, I, I'll, I can send it to you or sift through the uh, episodes we've done. And so my question then is, yeah, that's great. It was a great story. It was a great iteration of story. Now, how do we, how do we take that further? How do we have more doctors or more, uh, if you're a scientist in the middle of nowhere and you want to kind of convey your information to new audiences, how do you do that? We did one recently, as you can see on the right, on how do you defend yourself against online harassment? So this, so Mondays are sort of skills building. How do we use this internet thing and not let, not have it wreck us, uh, even as we pursue progress? Um, Wednesdays are policy and practice. And again, in March, I, con I connected directly live with a community uh, organizing group in Bhopal, India, who had built a food network. What was so cool to me was that some of them had already been involved in a plastics reduction campaign. These are middle-class people in Bhopal, a city of close to 2 million in India that then went through lockdown. And so the poorest people are locked at home and can't, they had no water, no way to keep themselves clean. A lot of them had a food crisis. So they built a food network. They turned a plastics campaign into a food network driving. The guy there in the dark on the lower left was actually driving while we were talking. Uh, to deliver food to uh, uh, one of the um, informal settlements in Bhopal. Uh, Fridays are news, and I've had um, lots of people on it's about journalism and, and media and the infodemic, lots to go to explore there. When this recording is done, you can sit back to the website and find more. I want to keep going. Sundays, I, you know, I'm a musician, as you heard, and, and this gets back to taking a breath. And, or having a group hug, I felt that the week needs to have a sense of a pause. You know, what are we actually about here? Um, and so, and I have a lot of friends who are musicians, but we started to connect with people like Joseph Pupi there. You could see Joseph is in uh, Lusaka, Zambia. So, you know, the downside of lockdown and where we're at now is constricted uh, two-dimensional connections. The upside is you can connect with anybody with internet connection. and and we've had some incredible musical moments with him. And there you can see a really good teacher, Jim Bentley. Some of you may know Jim Bentley. He's a, 
He's with place-based learning uh, maven uh, out in the Sacramento area, PBL works. And he's, uh, you know, he's a listener and deeply enthusiastic about this. Here's all a, here's around us example. there's hatred, all around us there's fear. Violence touches our lives and the message is clear. We mourn our martyrs, in our hearts they'll stay. Then we'll sing, we shall overcome and go on our way. We will not rest until hmm, the storm is over. Yeah, we will not lay this burden down. Yeah, we will keep each other strong. We will love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. Till we stand all together on solid ground. No. Hey. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so what that demonstrated to me so powerfully, and I imagine many of you have had the experience of having an emotional connection through this digital interface. And you can see there Genevieve uh, Gunther, who's um, writing a book right now about the language of climate change. And she's a literature uh, expert in re Renaissance literature who's deeply, she, she founded End, uh, End Climate Silence, the group and the, with the hashtag initially End Climate Silence. And there's uh, Andre Codrescu, a great poet who used to be a long, who was a long time NPR commentator. Reggie Harris, an amazing songwriter who I've known, who recently had the experience. He's, his, one of his uh, ancestors was uh, Wickham, one of the statues that was being torn down uh, in, around the country. Uh, his, so his, on one side, he has a slave owner as, a, as a, an ancestor, and the other, of course, a slave. And he met with the, the white ancestors of the same, uh, the same um, Oh, I got that wrong, not his ancestor. You know what I'm talking about. He met with some of the white family part of his family leading back to this uh, slave slaveholder. And that story is amazing too. So you can make connections that really have power, emotional power. But let's, so now we're gonna spend just a few minutes before we get into questions, getting back to this, that question that Ramesh uh, laid out as the goal of the meeting. Best practices to me, best practices is an attitude. Not, it's not a list of things. It's, it's, a, it's an attitude you wake up with. And it's like having that sense of what's working, what's not working, who's not in the room, thinking as much about who's not in the room, like who's not on this Zoom call as who is. Uh, how can we widen the landscape? How can you create more impact? Uh, you know, I kind of went through that metamorphosis of realizing journalism was had really big limits. I do long talks on that, and uh, but I'm and I wake up most mornings thinking, what can I do a little bit better? Um, one key is, of course, you are a story as a scientist or a technologist or a scholar, uh, like my friend Scott Knowles at Drexel, who I still never met face to face. If you haven't seen his COVID calls uh, webcast, you you owe it to yourself to look for that hashtag COVID calls. He's a story. He's inquiring through history of disasters. How do you get meaning around the current disaster? So you are a story. And one of the best simple exercises I found is to uh, pursue an answer to, to, the, to fill in the blank for this hashtag that was around Twitter eight or so years ago. I am a scientist because dot, dot, dot. Fill that in and you're starting with that connection that isn't about the spectro, uh, you know, the spectrometer you're using or or something technical in the science. It's about why you pursue a question. And that's a great start. Check your narrative capture. Let me see if this, is, this works. This was an extraordinary chat I had with Sudeep Chandra, who's a, 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 a lake ecologist out at the University of Nevada, Reno. Let's see if this works. Often what we don't examine in the context of, of global change is where are the resilient places uh, that might uh, persist or, or uh, evolve, if you will, over, over space and time. And one of the things that I struggle with as a scientist is I feel like all the media and everything we hear around us influences the type of research we do because the sky is always falling. And I would love someone to ask these questions of where is the sky not falling? And there's a group of researchers out in the West. We go to these meetings, smaller meetings, and we're starting to ask these questions. Where is the resiliency in the landscape? Why is the sky not falling in these locations? What does it mean for evolution of trajectories of society? Those types of, let's not call them just optimistic, but sort of realistic scenarios. Where can you go grapes in the future? Mm -hmm. 
those stories would be critical to incorporate in the future. Where are their resilient landscapes? Why do certain plants not shift in the landscape when there's climate change? For me, I want to study these lakes. Why are some lakes, like small lakes, why aren't they changing? Mm -hmm. Even though the temperature's warm a degree. Mm -hmm. So that was such a valuable conversation because he described how the media coverage of, in this case, climate change was driving research. We're all focusing on that worst case scenario, right? And that's important to, to focus on in some of our work, but not on the full landscape of how nature responds to changing climate. And uh, so narrative capture, a huge issue in journalism to me. I think it's a huge issue at every level and op opportunity, of course, of how we wake up in the morning and think about our careers and uh, trajectories to make sure we're looking at the full landscape and not being captured by s either externally or even within our own heads by some idea of how the world works. Often what we- Oops, sorry. Um, and here's one quick example, the Paradise, California disaster. You know, more than 80 people died in this town. And you can look at these satellite images are extraordinary. This is one community, one, one part of the neighborhood, one neighborhood there. And when you look at it, and when experts I interviewed talked to talked with about it, you can see it was not a forest fire. It was, as, as uh, Stephen Pine at Arizona said, it's an urban fire in a forest. And that completely changes the question, like what's going on, what do we do? Yeah, climate change is happening, but there's a lot of other stuff that's happening. There's actually two vital narratives there. One is about vulnerability. Built vulnerability is a huge part of what you're seeing around the world. Uh, settled and built vulner vulnerability. And then there is climate change, which is subtly, subtly shifting these factors that lead to a bad wildfire season. But if you're not focused on those two stories, whether, whether it's in research or whether it's in the media, we're missing real-time things that can happen now that can cut the thing we care about, which is risk and cut losses. That, that paper on the right, it's not Michael Mann, not the famous Michael Mann, it's another Michael Mann scientist. He says that they did careful modeling showing that by 2050, California is building 645,000 new houses in areas already mapped as severely at risk from wildfire. So that's just not climate change, that's community change. And that's something you could do something about right now while we work on the grand challenge of decarbonization. But narrative capture often uh, prevents us from absorbing those. But here's one, I'm gonna back up to, so flipping the script is, um, you know, we think of TikTok. TikTok's in the news for a variety of reasons right now. But there was this young woman who did this fab fabulous flipping of TikTok. And if you haven't seen this. Hi guys, so I'm gonna teach you guys how to get long lashes. So the first thing you need to do is grab your lash curler, curl your lashes, obviously. Then you're gonna put them down and use your phone that you're using right now to search up what's happening in China, how they're getting concentration camps, throwing innocent Muslims in there, separating their families from each other, kidnapping them, murdering them, raping them, forcing them to eat pork, forcing them to drink, forcing them to convert different religions, if not, or else they're gonna, of course, get murdered. People that go into these concentration camps, they'll come back alive. This is another Holocaust, yet no one is talking about it. Please be aware. Please spread awareness. And yeah, so you can grab your lash curler again. And Hi guys, that just blows my mind. It just blows my mind. I, I, haven't, I, I haven't done a story. I've got to find out more about how that came about. But it shows you, it's a fantastic way to slip into the tent and create a conversation around something in a new way. And you might have heard that China tried to, uh, uh, TikTok cancel, canceled her account initially, but then restored it. The Washington Post wrote about it. Had huge rever reverberations. Uh, this is another one I love, but I'm going to skip it to save time. It was on Facebook. It was a conversation, like a Facebook chat among endangered species by a guy who was in college at the time in Nova Scotia in Halifax. Think about that. You know, a young student in Halifax, Nova Scotia created a, a uh, meme that went around hundreds of thousands of people related to conversation, uh, wildlife con con conservation. Uh, that never could have happened 10 years earlier. Um, do the math. Obviously, you know, you're all into science <laughs> and numbers matter, but numbers matter even in terms of how we think about shaping stories or campaigns. I'm sure you know about the uh, su pretty much success, still a huge work, uh, huge amount of work to be done to save sharks. But uh, China really did flip on, on shark fins. Uh, the government actually changed uh, policies and attitudes. 
But the thing that to me drove me to write about it, I was in Beijing at the time uh, a few years ago, but, well, eight years ago, and I found a young woman there who had been part of the campaign, the shark fin campaign. She told me something so important that I'm here now. How, what's been your sense of how it's changed here for awareness of this issue? It's a huge change. Before 2005, uh, nobody really uh, know that was an issue for sharks. Um, when we did the um, like survey, 70% uh, of people didn't even know that um, shark fin soup come from shark because for Chinese words, Yu Chi didn't name us shark, shark fin. So they didn't know so, so much uh, like a shark being killed because of shark fin soup. So if you're going to start a campaign on stopping shark finning, it's good to know that 70% of Chinese didn't know there's shark in shark fin soup because the word for shark fin soup in China is basically fin soup. It doesn't mention sharks. And they, they did the surveys. They were careful. They understood, you know, with their, the challenge. And then you can start to craft the, the communication strategy. So uh, numbers matter there too. Uh, playing with data, you know, this is an infographic. This is data showing the same number of people in different transportation modes and then sitting. Uh, and that gives you a sense of the values of public transportation for congestion way more than some graph would. And I did a whole story about how this image came around and some other iterations of it because I was so interested in it. Um, play with data can be sonic. It doesn't have to be um, it doesn't have to be um, visual. Uh, here's a, there was a young University of Minnesota uh, student undergrad who worked with Scott St. George there uh, to turn climate data into a cello composition. And around the same time, uh, Julio Friedman, who's a top energy specialist at Columbia now, he was at Lawrence Livermore Labs. He created a little piece of music using data, NASA data on long-term climate change. And it says a lot. This is, a, again, a nascent opportunity to use these kinds of tools to connect audiences in different ways. That can be done in a concert hall or can be done online. Um, so it's hard to judge success yet. Another fantastic example, if you look on Twitter, there's so many scientists who've dived into Twitter uh, as visualiz visualizers who aren't really, didn't come around. It's not like they studied climate change to be a visualization expert, Ed Hawkins, is a, a great example in the UK. His warming stripes, some of you may even have a tie or a shirt or something with that pattern on it. And as you can see, Jeff Baradelli, who's at Columbia, a meteorologist in CBS, is one of those driving this to be for meteorologists to wear these ties and, and to get that conversation going. It ended up on the cover of The Economist. Uh, and it came about because of his creativity as a visual, visually interested scientist. What's even cooler is that there's a community, and we're going to talk about community in a second. I'm going to try to race through some last points so we have time for questions. What was so interesting recently on Twitter the last couple of years is Ed, Ed Hawkins had this basic idea. You can turn climate data into a colored warming stripes. Uh, and uh, Al Alex Radke in Germany noted that the problem with that is it only takes it to now. So it's data from 1860 or whatever through now. But... He, so he started to mod, use the model output to say, well, what are the different emissions trajectories lead to for the colors and climate? And so I love that idea that there's a community, a creative community on Twitter that's around, not just coming up with something cool, but then iterating it going forward. On COVID-19, there's numerous examples of this um, and they travel around the world. Uh, X, look, uh, look for at XTOTL, XTOTL, who's a, a illustrator from New Zealand, who's created a, innumerable graphics showing ways to flatten the curve, the animations, fantastic work that came from New Zealand and now is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, play with others. <laughs> Obviously, you know, whether it's a campus or the community, the global community, the idea is to break out of your silos. And that's what I'm trying to do at Columbia is to build that vibe. Again, this was obviously pre-COVID. 
on campus to get artists uh, and, and uh, journalists together with scientists and uh, brainstormed about around approaches. There's even Chuck Nice, the comedian, is in the room. Uh, there's some great examples of comedy and journalism. I mean, and here, like, here's one quick example of a transition that's underway. Back in 1970, a very famous artist, uh, Robert Smithson, created this spiral jetty. Built, it's built out into the Great Salt Lake. That's a big structure. You can walk out on it. It's, it's um, probably a half mile long. And, but it's static and it was visualizing something. Um, you know, it also was intrusive <laughs> into lake ecology. And on the right is Spiral Wetland, which is Stacy Levy, an artist in Pennsylvania, who's taken that form and creating art that remediates. So her artwork in lakes actually absorbs pollutants and um, uh, you know, nutrient overload. So that only comes about through the interaction of arts and sciences. Um, there are many different paths and finding the right approach for the right audience is a key thing. These are examples I've written about before. Seismic Sound Lab at Columbia is uh, seismologists are using visualizations. They're doing big things in you know, auditoriums using music to, to get people under, to understand the dynamics of the earth. And then Roger Billum at, at, in Colorado was creating posters showing how to avoid um, so that communities don't are not building vulnerability again in, in earthquake zones uh, in the right language using the right visuals. Um, Thriving Earth Exchange, the American Geophysical Union, is a great example of what I think is a key keystone for anyone who wants to communicate effectively, which is it's it's a way to connect uh, all the tens of thousands of earth and hydrology and climate and soil scientists at AGU with communities with problems, you know, flooding and erosion and, and, and landslide risk and the like. And they had, their approach is iterative. It's not a one, you don't just come in and give a PowerPoint and go home. You have to be engaged in an ongoing conversation with communities. And in a world that needs more resilience, sustained approaches to changing zoning with rising sea levels or wildfire risk in the West, without that sustained connectivity, you're not gonna get the, the action you want on the ground. So you can go back and review the slides too when we're done. So how do you do your own network? Just briefly at Columbia, we're building one. Uh, it's been disrupted in some ways and accelerated in others by what's happened with COVID-19. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of key points here. The questions I was asking in initial survey were, what do you hope to gain or give in joining this communication network, which is about what I call SUSTCOM, you know, sustainability communication. So there are people out there who can give and people who can gain. And most everybody just wants to connect. Here's a, here, do you use social media? As you can see, enthusiasts, 41% said, there, uh, 200 respondents said, yeah, we're enthusiasts. Hopeful but hesitant is 25%. Grudging is 14%. So what I want to do is create an interface, an ecosystem where the 41% can interact with the, the hesitant but hopeful and nudge us into a bigger community of impact. And you can do this anywhere if you just start to build that landscape of change. Same thing for public face-to-face -face, uh, lecturing. And you know, it's, it, we are gonna have face-to-face -face interaction going forward. This is gonna take time, uh, but there's some great examples at Columbia and anywhere in how to engage communities directly. Just Google for BioBus and you'll see a fantastic example of a young scientist in, in public health, in actually in, in um, uh, it was brain science, uh, microbiology. They created a bus that goes around to communities to get kids excited. So that's the story here for the moment. Um, this was something that was said at the, the, by the Vatican. The media of social communication can contribute a great deal to human unity. If our minds are ill disposed to this though, this outpouring of technology could have the opposite effect. So there's less understanding, we divide. And what's really interesting about this is this was written in 1963. This was not about the internet. These tools, these practices, the attitudes we need to forge progress with communication are not a function of technology. They're, they're really more profound than that. And the Pope, uh, I, wrote, I was at the Vatican in 2014 for a big meeting on sustainability. And it was great to see here, even in his encyclical on climate, the Pope had this line, efforts need to be made to help those, these media become sources of new cultural progress for humanity and not a threat to our deepest riches. And I couldn't agree more. So thank you. And um, yeah, let me just stop sharing screen.
And if there's some questions, I'm here for you. Thank you so much, Andy. That was, that was great. Um, so we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to maybe bleed a little bit into the break. Um, so first question I had was from Dean Dryden. He says, I'm a journalist interested in agriculture and the environment. Um, what are the best ways to stay ahead of the headlines and find emerging stories in science fields? Well, there for sure. I assume he's in agriculture because he wants to help feed the world through this transition we're in toward where we're heading on climate and COVID and the like. And that means uh, connecting with farmers and communities uh, engaged in agriculture, staying as close to the landscape there as possible is really important if you want to, if you're doing work that will then inform a farmer. If you're doing work that will inform a consumer, it's a completely different question. So it's all choosing your target, um, thinking carefully about where you want to go with your work your actual inquiry and then, but also again, is, is, is my target the consumer? Is, is it the farmer? Is it policy that helps or hurts farmers? And then you can start to go forward. Um, another question we had was uh, from Amanda. Um, as I looked at some of the artistic visualizations of the data, I was curious whether you have any comments on the balance between using striking visualizations to actually convey information, e.g. to non-scientists, versus to capture interest to lead to a deeper conversation or engagement? To me, it's all about engagement. You can, you can never really fully examine these tough questions we're talking about without a, a clever graphic like that Toronto uh, Transportation Commission graph uh, animation leading to a bigger, a deeper discussion. Because there's all kinds of issues and impediments, whether it's uh, you know uh, congestion pricing, you know how do you then decongest a, a city, is a whole big landscape of questions. So so to me it, it really is um, the infographics or the like are really a starting point. Um, and there I use examples of like if you care about methane releases, uh, infrared imagery can show you this gas that's otherwise transparent. And at least that then says, oh, there's something leaking here. This is a problem or not. You know, the community can then go forward. Right. Um, a question I have, and this will be the last one we have, um, is how did you, uh, so you put up that slide at the beginning of, that you called the infodemic. So what have, uh, what have you found uh, that these conversations have, or have these conversations allowed you to cut through that infodemic more effectively? You know, these connections that you're making. The, uh, the conversations I'm running have involved people who know a lot more about that than, than I do. Um, Rene Daresta at Stanford Internet Observatory and uh, Claire Wardle at First Draft News and a bunch of technologists who are studying how the um, social media, how the social web works, are deeply in tune with how we're going to have to confront a big pulse of new and misinformation as the uh, vaccine when a vaccine starts to emerge. Um, and my goal with those conversations is to, is to start the dialogue now to build, to have experts talking to each other who might not connect with each other around, well, what practices can lead to better outcomes when that happens. Um, I did a couple of sessions on the World Health Organization's meeting. They just had a two week meeting around uh, to, to try to draw academia into a new field called infodemiology. <laughs> which isn't epidemiology and it isn't communication science. It's how do you look at the pandemic risk and ways that can get us again, a landscape where, where reality approach can have some chance of success. It, it's a huge challenge. The, the power, the downside power of all this, the hackable power, the, the, the ability of a, a small anti-vaxxer community to infect and infest a larger community is enormous. And, and that's true for everything we've been talking about so far. This is not a happy story yet. You know, again, as I said, the internet, this thing that's connecting us all can divide us all and it's new. And, and usually what happens is exploitation starts first and then you, you're, what you have to try to do is figure out a way to at least catch up a little bit or to spread practices so that, one last thing I'll say is that a key part of getting through the infodemic whether it's around climate change or the pandemic, is sort of an informed consumer. What is it that the, you can empower 
information consumers with practices or tools, both, that can give you that pause factor before you retweet something that's fundamentally wrong. And even a month ago, I, I retweeted something that I looked later and turned out to be wrong. And so it's like, we're all working at that. We've been hacked. Our brains are very easy to hack when it comes to this stuff. Uh, so that, that picture of the guy like this is still a big 